We have seen in our study in Genesis chapter 12, we have seen the principle of the New Testament um, foreshadowed. The New Testament teaches us that the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the, the allure of the world system, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life are all ways in which Christians have to battle Satan. And I've talked about before how Canaan really is God's promised land, yet at the same time it was this place where there was a constant temptation for the people of God to enter into the lust of the eyes, uh, particularly sexual temptation. And um, there's a lot of compromise on the part of the Israelites in taking uh, the virgin pagan women from the enemies they had and taking them to their, as wives or as concubines. Um, there is a lot of prostitution that goes on in that land of Canaan. There also is a very prevalent temptation and constant uh, pattern of the people of God to fall into doing things their way instead of God's way and in trying to look the part rather than trusting God. But there is another aspect of our battle against Satan that I don't think Canaan reflects as well as another place does, which we're going to see as we journey on today in Genesis 12. We see Abram going to Egypt. And Egypt in Scripture is a place flat out that in the Old Testament is a reference to, yes, the physical place of Egypt, but it's also a spiritual connotation of this is a place of bondage to the world. Egypt, for many centuries, was really the predominant world power. It was a very strong, militarily speaking, and very uh, luxuriant or, or very honored uh, place as well. For some reason, these, these colonies in the desert on the banks of a river the Nile are very fertile, and they, of course, are very strong militarily, but they're economic powerhouses, and they also have a lot of food in the midst of famine, and many times the people of God are going there. Now, we don't see Abraham go here directly because he's going after the world's way. He's going there, as we're going to see, because of actual need. He needs food. A famine's going on. He needs to go there for food, but the allure of the world and worldliness happens. And worldliness, Scripture tells us in the New Testament, if we are friends of the world, if we are worldly as believers, we become the enemies of God. We do not have God's favor when we are living in that way. And we're going to see that as we look here. That Egypt is a very real place, not just of temptation, but of giving in to the worldly way of life. A life really devoid of trusting God and of completely trusting in the world's values and priorities. So let's pick up in verse 10 today. Now there was a famine in the land. Now remember Abraham had been traveling as a nomad in the land of Canaan. God has promised that land to him. Abraham has experienced Bethel of worshiping God and intimacy with God. And now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. He's planning to just, you know, take a little bit of time for the famine was severe in the land. In verse 11, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife. Now here's the thing. He's going into Egypt. And he decides to take a very ungodly, worldly way of approaching this. He needs to go there for food. That's the practical reason. But look at what he says. He's definitely taking a worldly view here. He's fearful. He's not resting in the promise that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. Instead, he is given in to fear, and he's turning into the ways and priorities and thinking of the world. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful and when the princes, 
of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and Fer- and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. I want to stop right there. Now, it has not yet told us, I do not believe scripture has yet given us the exact indication of how old Abram is. But many scholars believe that at this point, in studying scripture and comparing the different passages, that, that Sarah and Abraham are probably in their 70s. Abraham's wife, Sarai, is apparently so smoking hot at 70 that he's afraid to call her his wife. Now, the truth is, Abraham's telling a half-truth. He's telling a half-lie. So, Well, it's a whole lie. It's a half-truth, so to speak. Because we do find out that Sarai is Abram's half-sister. But she is his wife. And he doesn't want her to tell them that because he's afraid of his life. Well, Abraham was to some extent correct. They get to Egypt. The the princes of see her and they commend her to Pharaoh. And what does commend mean? I mean, I just start kind of thinking about it. You know, what, what would these guys say? These princes see this beautiful woman. She's 70 years old, though, but she's apparently smoking hot is the best vernacular I can put it into. And that's what they do. They commit, look at this woman. You need to take her, Pharaoh, into your house. She needs to become one of your concubines. You take her into your harem. Pharaoh does. And Abram goes along with it. A very ungodly thing. Would it not be better to suffer for righteousness rather than to go along with unrighteousness? Wouldn't it be better if Abraham was somehow persecuted? We we even know God's promise to Abraham. He has a specific promise from God. If people curse you, I'm going to curse them. So Abraham knows, I'm going to have descendants. God's told him this. He's not resting in God's promises. He's already given into his fear. We saw that. He's afraid, which is his motive. But he's not remembering God's promises and resting in them. No nation has come from Abraham. He doesn't have children yet. They haven't inherited the land. Wouldn't it be better to, from the beginning, say, yes, she's my wife, and if he's thrown in jail or treated wrongly because of it, God would miraculously move to protect him. We know that from God's very promises already to Abraham, that he would bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. And yet Abraham goes on along with this and is very worldly and ungodly in his life. And it's argued, we can even say as we go on, that Abraham probably brings shame upon the Lord's name by his actions. The believer backslidden does not result in good things. Our testimony is weakened and our sin does not just hurt ourselves, it hurts others. And the reality is every believer experiences that. Every believer has backslidden at some point in some way. We see here now as we go on the details Verse 16, so we've seen Sarai is taken into Pharaoh's house. Then verse 16, and for her sake he dealt, that's Pharaoh, dealt well with Abram. For he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. He gets all types of livestock. He gets more slaves. Abraham does. Verse 17, but the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you not tell me? Why did why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him and sent him away with his wife and all that he had. We don't know why uh, or Excuse me, we don't know how uh, Pharaoh comes to discover that Sarai is his wife, but we know that God does plague Pharaoh. It's kind of interesting, too, that even in the middle of Abraham's backslidden ways and ungodly, worldly ways, that he still amasses even more material wealth from the world. And it appears he gets to keep it. Pharaoh sends him away with all he has. Pharaoh gets more livestock, more slaves, more things from Pharaoh. He gets his wife. 
and they're kicked out of Egypt. Kind of interesting. They're kicked out of Egypt, and all this stuff transpires. But Sarai did spend a time in Pharaoh's harem. And so, the good thing, though, that we see is that an ungodly king, Pharaoh, acts with some shred of morals, which is kind of what surprises us in this whole story. The Christian here, Abram, is not living as he should. The ungodly behaves more like a Christian should. He discovers, however he did, we don't know, but he discovers that Sarai is actually Abram's wife, and he gives her back and sends him away. He's also experiencing great plagues but upon his house, but he obeys God's way rather than Abraham. It's a convicting experience when God has to use the world to act in the right way rather than the believer. It's convicting to the believer and very telling as well about where we've been. So we'll stop there today and we'll pick up next time seeing where Abraham goes because it's kind of interesting, I think, where he ends up going. But let us close in prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, the symbol Egypt is to us and it bears some very heavy lessons for us to apply to our life. Today I just ask, Lord, that you would work in all of our lives to take a few moments and really just spend the time with you on how to apply the lessons of Abraham's life here in our own lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.